Warning, the renegade recruiter is not for the soft, timid, or faint-hearted. If you need permission or seek approval from your mother, spouse, mates in the pub, or anyone else for that matter, this really isn't for you. If any of what you've heard puts you off in the slightest, I advise you not to listen any further. You've been warned. Prepare yourself for the no bullshit, zero fluff. Quick, dirty, and uncensored secrets for any serious recruitment, staffing, and search business owner who wants to earn more money with less work and fewer headaches, without having to kiss ass or bend over backwards to please anyone. He's a relentless and fearless renegade who will stop at nothing to reveal the harsh, unforgiving, and brutal truth about what it really takes to succeed in this business. He's a guy people love to hate and hate to love. It's your host, Terry Edwards. The Renegade Recruiter is unleashed. Well, hello, 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 and welcome to this week's podcast and another episode of The Renegade Recruiter. And of course, we're joined by our co-host, Drew. How are you, Drew? I'm good, thank you, Terry. How are you? Uh, Very good indeed. Very good indeed. And this week, uh, we're going to be looking at Actually, before I get into that, let, let me just do a bit of, a bit of housekeeping. As I mentioned before, uh, if, you, if you want access to any of the show notes and you're enjoying this, first of all, if you're enjoying this, tell all your friends and leave a review. If you don't enjoy it, please stop listening. If you're enjoying this, <laughs> share it with every you. week. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, but seriously, um, yeah, so share it with your friends. Please, please, please leave us a review. Uh, uh, Always good, always good to get to, to, to get your reviews. Now, we talked about this last week. We talked about we're going to share with you what you can, what you as a recruiter or search consultant can learn from um, House of Cards. Sorry, I just had a, I just had a mental block there. <laughs> I can't remember the name of the, of the, of the program, but uh, mentioned it many times. Drew and I are big fans of, of the House of Cards. Uh, which is on Netflix and the new series has just come out. For those that don't know, uh, uh, House of Cards is uh, stars um, Kevin Spacey and in the, pro- in the film he's Francis Underwood um, in South, based in South Carolina and he's a ruthless politician. Um, absolutely ruthless politician, of that there's, there's no doubt. Uh, but it's, really, it's a great American political drama um, and well worth watching. If you haven't seen it before, Get over and watch it as, as quickly as possible. Um, so I've talked about the, 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 sh- the show notes, but let me just give you some, some quotes from, fr- from the show. One of the first ones is, if you don't like how the table is set, turn over the table. And what they mean by that, there are plenty of rules we have to live by, but one isn't to sit by and let things just happen to you. If you don't like the way things are right now, change it right now so here because here's what we know with a really successful recruitment and search firm owners they do just that so we talk to some recruitment and search firm owners and they complain about their consultants underperforming that's a, a classic example and how their consultants they, they probably employ 10 consultants but two or three of them underperforming and these consultants are costing me money and i i don't know why how i'm putting up with this and why i'm doing this well that's your choice Look, if you've got consultants that are performing, you should do one of two things. One, either manage them out of the business, or two, get them to improve their performance. If you're working with clients right now that you don't enjoy working with and they keep beating you down on price, you've got a choice of that as well. Either negotiate the fees and get higher fees, or don't work with them. But the point is, you don't have to do that kind of thing. If you don't like how the table is set, turn over the table true yeah and again you, you covered this in a in an email quite recently um yeah if you don't basically there's no room for complaining there's no point there's no use there's no benefit to it if you don't like something then change it there's no point in complaining about it excellent excellent but nothing from frank edwards of uh of house of cards is for those of us climbing to the top of the food chain, there can be no mercy. There is but one rule, hunt or be hunted. 
This is one of those rules mentioned uh, before. Um, but basically what he's saying is if you don't want to be thrown under the bus for things, you have to be one step ahead. Now, I'm not talking about trampling all over somebody else, but if it's a, bit, if it's a bear that's chasing you, you um, and it's only a few steps behind you, your best bet is probably to distract them with some fresh meat. And, you know, again, Drew and I have mentioned in an email a book that we recently read called 10X. And in there, he talked about don't compete with your competitors, dominate them. And it's exactly the same thing. If you want to get to the top, uh, there, be can, there can be one rule, be, uh, to be hunted or, 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 to, or, sorry, to hunt or be hunted. Anything to add to that, Drew? Yeah, I, again, when I see this quote, I immediately think about marketing your, your business. I mean, you, you get so many recruitment and search for moments who actually shy away from the marketing and sales, or more, more so the marketing side of their business. I see it almost mm. as, a, as a secondary thing that they need to do. Um, but yeah, you need to be constantly going out there and hunting for new clients, hunting for new business, as well as sort of maintaining the clients you've got. And it's important that your lead generation and developing new relationships, developing new leads is a part of your sort of everyday activity. Excellent. Yeah, a really good point. And, and the moment that you can do this and you've got more leads than you can actually handle, then you decide who you're going to work with. But for many recruiters and search firms, they get so few leads in. So the average consultant will get maybe one, two leads a week in. Now, we've got some of our clients are generating 40, 50 leads a month per consultant. Imagine what that would mean to you if you were generating that, that number of leads. But that's, that's making that choice uh, to actually do that. And you know, if you talk, we, we talk to recruiters and search firm owners every day of the week, and they all say, yeah, that's what we want to do. Um, but then for a number of reasons, they, 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 they don't do it. But it, quite frankly, uh, you will either be, uh, it, there's one rule, hunt or be hunted, as I said before. The next quote is, the nature of promises, Linda, is that they remain immune to changing circumstances. I want to read that again. The nature of promises, Linda, is that they remain immune to changing circumstances. And in a nutshell, what he's saying there, it's, it's absolutely imperative that you keep your promises to your friends, to your family, to your work colleagues, to your clients, to your candidates, but most importantly, that you keep the promises to yourself. I get that things may change, um, and things might come up, but unless it's unthinkable, it's imperative that you stay tr true to your world, true to your word, rather. For so many uh, owners and directors of recruitment to search businesses, and I, I don't even think it replies just to, re to recruiters, to be fair, but to business owners, because you're not answerable to anybody, you can say to yourself, yeah, I'm going to do that, yeah, I'm going to implement a marketing campaign and generate leads or yeah i'm, I'm gonna get fit or whatever, whatever it is and for many people they then don't do it but here's the problem with that and not sticking to your promises we all know people we all we all have friends or friends or friends but we all know somebody that they say things like yeah i'm going to and you insert whatever i'm going to do this i'm going to do that and you kind of look at them thinking yeah you always say that you always say you're going to do stuff but you never ever do. And you're aware of how that's affected your relationship with that individual. But the most important relationship you have right now is the relationship you have with yourself. And how often do you say to yourself, yeah, I'm gonna do X, Y, Z, and then don't do it? Are you aware of the impact that is having on the relationship you have with yourself? Because every time you say that, another part of you is saying, yeah, you always say that, but you never do it. Huh. True. Yeah. yeah. I thought I was going to say you were going to ask something there. I heard a, I heard um, a grunt. <laughs> yeah, just to say that. <laughs> um, yeah. Again, we all know someone like this. Where, and again, you you spoke about it in the email a while ago, Terry. Where you you, you don't take them seriously. They're always saying they're going to. So it could be around diet, and they always say they're going to start this new diet, or they always say they're going to do X, or they always they always late, right? And then. What happens is, it's not like you dislike that person, uh, and they'll still be part of your life, but what happens is whenever they say they're going to do something, you, you, you sort of don't take them seriously. There's an element of distrust there. 
You don't yeah. trust their word. They say they're going to, oh, I'll be there at 8 o'clock. And you're thinking, well, you're always late. So you're probably going to be there at 8.30. Or they say, I'm going to start my diet on Monday. And you say, well, you're thinking to yourself, well, you said that last Monday, so you probably won't. Okay? It's one thing when you're thinking about that, you're thinking like that about somebody else. But when you start to think that about yourself, when you say to yourself, okay, on Monday I'm going to start my diet, and you said that for the last four weeks in a row, and your subconscious kicks in and says, well, you said that last week and the week before and the week before and you didn't do it. Or you say, oh, okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to start marketing on Monday. I'm going to do this. I'm going to send this many emails. I'm going to make this many calls. Whatever it is, whatever commitment you make to yourself, if you constantly break those promises, you stop taking yourself seriously. Okay, you need to stick to your promises. Again, well, I think we spoke about it before um, or sort of someone that we've, we've sort of brought up many times is the author... Uh, Dan Kennedy. Whenever, when it comes to marketing, if anyone knows what they're talking about, when it comes to direct response marketing, uh, they will have inevitably learn from Dan Kennedy. They would be a student of Dan Kennedy. So we, it's someone that we refer to quite a lot. But one of the commitments that he made very early on in his career, so I think he's written something like 16 books so far. But one of the commitments he made early on in his career was to write a page every single day. Okay, and he took that to extreme. So on he, on his mother's funeral, he writ a page of writing. And now that, that, again, it sounds extreme, but the way he saw it was he made a commitment. He made a promise. So no matter what, he was going to do a certain action. And the nature of promises is that they, they, they're immune to changing circumstances. Okay, so when you make a promise to yourself, make sure that you stick to it. Excellent, excellent. And just on the other side of that coin as well, we've all got friends or know of people who when they say they're going to do something and they look you in the eye, you kind of look them straight back in the white of their eyes. You think, yeah, you're going to do that because that's what you do. When you say you're going to do something, I know you're going to do it. Yeah. And, you know, again, it's a completely different relationship to that flaky person. I remember years ago when I had my own search business, there was a chap called Kevin who I was really keen to join us. Um, and I'd probably meet up with him once a month. We'd, we'd have a meet for a coffee or meet for a beer. And he'd say, yeah, Tara, I'm going to, I'll be joining you next month and next month. You know, he never ever joined us, but he must have told me at least 15 times that he was, he was going to be joining up. He just had to get this sorted out or, or get this sorted out. Um, but he never, I, I kind of lost touch with him now. Um, but certainly after the first three or four times, I just used to look and think, yeah, whatever, Kevin. You've been saying this for some time now. It ain't going to happen. And sure enough, it never did. So j just to repeat, the nature of a promise is that they remain immune to change in circumstances. Another quote is, there is no better way to overpower a trickle of doubt than with a flood of naked truth. You see, the truth will always overpower doubt. So know your facts. When you don't have an answer, be absolutely honest and uh, with, with your client and say, look, do you know, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Hiring Manager, I haven't got the answer for that for you right now, but I'll go away and I'll find out and I'll get back to you in the next 48 hours or 24 hours or whatever it is. See, because at least you're being honest then. But whatever you do, don't sit there and give the, the old BS, you know, crikey, I'm a, I'm a search consultant, a recruiter, and I, I should know the answer to this question. Because you're just making things worse for yourself. So the absolute truth is, is, is imperative when, when you're communicating uh, directly with a with client or with a candidate as well, by the way. And, and by the same token, if you're communicating, let's say it's online or with an with a email or with a letter or thing, what, a real powerful way of, of, of communicating and communicating that truth is with testimonials. Um, one of the things with, 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 with good testimonials, let me give you the difference between a really good testimonial and a lousy testimonial. So lousy testimonials, yeah, I've worked with Fred before and they did a great job. It's Mike, and that's it. A really powerful testimony would be something like, do you know, I had some reservations before I worked with Fred, um, but one of the benefits of working with Fred is that he found me top quality candidates, blah, 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 blah. And I would recommend uh, this recruiter to, to anybody else. And then giving the full name, address, and website of the person that's giving that testimonial. Now, at this point, a lot of recruiters and search firms say, yeah, but if I do that, Terry, other rec my competitor's gonna give them a call. And I always say the same thing. Do you not think they're getting those phone calls anyway? And think about this as well. If a client gives you a glowing testimony about how great you are, they're less likely to leave you, go, go work, with, work with your competitors, because it's, it doesn't make sense, does it? They give you a glowing testimony and say, yeah, but I'm not gonna work with you anymore. 
Anything to add to that, Drew? Uh, no, again, I think you covered that really well. You're listening to the Renegade Recruiter Unleashed podcast. For show notes, additional resources, and podcast updates, head over to www.therenegaderecruiter.com. Excellent. So just to repeat, uh, there is no better way to overpower a trickle of doubt than with a flood of naked truth. The next one is appeal to the heart, not to the brain. See, from a buying perspective, all buying decisions are made based on emotion and justified with logic. Let me repeat that. All buying decisions are made based on emotion, but we then justify it with logic. And regards to what you might think, you may be the most logical individuals you're listening to thinking, yeah, but I'm very logical, Terry, and I need, I need, I need the facts and figures. I'm sure you do, but your decision's based on emotion. And if you think about, um, say, the adverts that you see on, on TV for, let's say, a motor car, if you think about it logically, it costs them millions uh, to actually produce those, those ads. And they could just have a, a blackboard there, and they could simply write on the blackboards all the features and benefits about the car. Uh, very cheap and surely effective if we made our decisions based on logic. But no, no, no. They have a very, always a very attractive person driving the car. Uh, uh, the, the shots of the, of, 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 the, of the, the whole image is very, very attractive and, and often very glamorous because what they want to do is they want to tap into your emotions because they know that's where you're going to make your decision. When you're justifying it to your friends and your family, you'll give very logical reasons as to why you bought the car but they're actually based on emotion rather than logic. True. Yeah, I think, I think one of the best examples of this is uh, charity adverts. Um, again, if you think about any advert that's trying to get you to donate money in any way, um, they're really strong on using emotions. They, like if, yeah, think to any advert you've seen, they usually show you someone in a, in a, a situation of really intense pain, really, uh, like a really negative place. And the message is that if you want to stop this happening, then please donate. Yeah, good example, a good example. And how a, a recruiter can use it, let's say you're, uh, to the top of my head now, if you're a, if you're a, a search firm and let's say you recruit uh, sales professionals, as an example, when you're communicating to the hiring manager or let's say to the sales director or VP of sales or whatever, and let's say you're, you're communicating, let's say by a letter or an email, you would say things like, if you're a hiring manager looking for top performing sales professionals, but you find it frustrating, unable to find the candidates, then come into your organization and hit the ground running, leaving you frustrated and annoyed and meaning that you're not going to hit your budget and the impact that has on your family life, that's really tapping into the hiring manager's emotions. And you can go and say, well, it doesn't have to be like that. Uh, uh, click on this link here and discover three ways that you can attract top performing sales professionals uh, easily and e effortlessly. See, that kind of message where you've tapped into their emotions is, is, is going to get a really good response. As human beings, we're motivated by one of two things, to avoid pain and gain pleasure. So as you're communicating to your potential clients, you'll be tapping into that. So you're going to be tapping into their pain and the frustrations that they're feeling. And you're going to tap into uh, the offering that you're going to provide that's going to give them the pleasure, that's going to eliminate all, all, all that pain. So just to repeat, appeal to the heart, not to the brain. I think another good example I've just, just come to mind is... Um, is if you look at, at, at if you go into a jeweler's, if you look into a, at a magazine and look at the watches that are on display, if you look very carefully, look at the time they will display. Often the time will be something like ten to two, uh, but whatever happens, the the hands of the of the watch or the clock will be will have a smiley face. Now think about it. Go just go and, go now and, and no, look at the magazine or whatever. It's not coincidence that they, the hands are always in that face because it's a smiley face. Because what, what watch manufacturers uh, discovered, that if they had a, a, a frown rather than a smile, they didn't sell as well. Something as simple as that. So tap into your client's emotions to get, get them to, uh, to, 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 to make a decision. Next quote is, from the moment, from, sorry, from this moment on, you are a rock. You absorb nothing. You say nothing and nothing breaks you. There are times to learn, times to take in everything around you, and there are other times when you need to be immune to things around you in order to survive. 
sometimes it's just better to be a fly on the wall. And I think one of the best examples of this is criticism. See, here's what's going to happen. As an owner or director of a, of a recruitment or search firm, I would strongly recommend that you step up your marketing everywhere on all the platforms. But here's the thing, there are over 100 different ways that you as a recruiter or search firm owner can generate leads. Most recruiters only know three or four. Cold calling, word of mouth, marketing the candidate and networking. But there's over 100. Now here's the thing, once you step, step up your marketing and your competitors in particular start to see you all over LinkedIn, all over Google, all over Facebook, they see you on YouTube and you're absolutely everywhere, they're the ones that are going to start to criticize you. But that's their problem, not yours. I think it was Dan Kenny that says that, um, that when you're marketing, if you haven't pissed somebody off by 11 o'clock in the morning, then you're not doing sufficient marketing. So become immune to other people's criticism because in most cases, it's not there to serve you. Anything to add to that, Drew? Um, yeah, so I think even sometimes, sometimes people criticize you and they, they do have your best intentions, like it might be uh, your, your partner or something, they'll say you, but for example, if, if I think back uh, in my business, like, and in your business as well, Terry, I know you, you now send daily emails. Mm -hmm. When you've done that, before, before you've done it, like, you're like you, people would have said, no, it's the wrong thing to do. And they're not necessarily doing it to hold you back, they truly believe it is the wrong thing to do. Um, but yeah. You, so it's not, it's not, uh, yeah, the point is just, it's not necessarily people who, sometimes people can criticize you and they do have your best intentions, but you still need to be immune to that. You still need to ignore it. The only thing that really you can measure in your business is results. Okay. Before you can really uh, decide whether something works or doesn't work, whether it's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do, you need to first do it and then measure the results that you get. Ah, so really good point there, Drew, and that's a great example you brought up with the emails, because of the resistance that um, I got to daily emails and people saying things like, oh, well, that's not going to work, you're going to piss off your, your list and people are un unsubscribing. Yeah, did people unsubscribe? Yeah, of course they did. Did we get more business? Yeah. Uh, did we test it first of all to see? Of course we did. And did we see the results that we got and saw that was the improvement? Of course we did. But that, that's, that's a great example that you brought up there because people said to me, well, if I was receiving your emails every day, Terry, that would pee me off and I, and I wouldn't like that. But again, that's somebody's opinion rather than a statement of fact. And it's really important um, that you get that. It's a really good point. Yeah, thanks for reminding me of that, Drew. It's brought, brought back memories that I had, yeah, many years ago when we, when we embarked on that. Anything else to add to that, Drew? Uh, no, nothing, nothing on that point, no. Right, thanks for that. Next one. To improve is to change. To perfect is to change often. That actual quote was on the back of, um, of a watch given to Frank. See, no one ever got better at anything by sitting on his or her uh, uh, couch watching. Uh, perhaps if they're, they're maybe, maybe if they're watching Netflix. Um, but being static, static isn't the way to achieve anything. So for you to improve, You've got to get up and keep changing and keep taking action. So you, I get that you might be doing things right now. And I'll go back to the old scenario that majority, probably 95% of recruiters are only using four different methods for generating leads. Some I talk to, they're only using two. Think about that for a minute. If your competitor is using 40 or 50 different methods and you're only using two methods for generating leads, What's the implications for you if you continue to do that and only use the two old methods, especially if you're doing things like, like just cold calling and, and word of mouth. And it's not even systemized either. That's the other thing that gets me. That some recruiters do this stuff and it's not even systemized in any way whatsoever. So they do it every now and then when they kind of think about it. If you want to improve, you've got to change. And you've got to, you've got to be aware of what's going on in the marketplace. So many recruiters aren't doing any online marketing whatsoever, and it's costing them millions. I mean literally millions in lost revenue. And, and some of the things with, with online marketing is that, that you can test some of this stuff, and if it doesn't work, it almost doesn't matter, because a lot of the online marketing that you do, there's no cost involved. You only have to pay if it works. So you literally, you only pay if you get a lead. 
but majority of recruiters have absolutely no idea. Yeah, well, we've always done it this way. But let me repeat, to improve is to change. To perfect is to change often. True. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you, yeah, if you're happy with the situation you're in now, then, then don't change anything. But if you want to improve, then yeah, you're going to have to change. Yeah, excellent. The next one, there are two types of vice presidents, doormats and matadors. Which do you think I intend to be? And that was Frank talking when, he's, when he was about to become vice president. But you can replace the word vice president to, there are two types of recruitment business owners, doormats and matadors. Which one do you intend to be? And it always rings true. To, the, to, be, to be the best at what you are, you can't let people walk all over you and still expect to excel. Unless, of course, you want to be the doormat. So whatever you do, make that decision to be the matador and to work on your terms and on your rules and work on win-win uh, with your clients. Drew? Yeah. Anything to add to that? No, I've got nothing to add to that point. Excellent, excellent. And the next one is, I wouldn't be sitting here if I wanted a shoulder to cry on. And this is all about accepting 100% 100, 100 responsibility for everything in your life. Now, usually at this point, when we say to uh, clients, look, for you to achieve what, do, what it is you want to achieve, here's something you, you must do. You must accept 100% responsibility for absolutely everything in your life. The money in your bank account right now, you're 100% responsible for that. For the billions that you're achieving right now, you're 100% responsible for right now. For the lousy clients that you're working with right now, you're responsible for that. For the lousy consultants you're employing, you're responsible for that. Because here's the thing about that. The moment you can accept 100% responsibility, you're saying at some level, I can do something about this. See, you start blaming the government, the weather, the economic climate, uh, the market that you operate in. What you're saying is, that's just the way it is, and there's nothing I can do about it. But if you're not happy about something, you say, actually, I'm responsible for this, so I can do something about it, then you're in with a much better chance. True. Yeah, get, yeah, nothing to add to that. Excellent, thanks. And the last one, even Achilles was only as strong as his heel. This is so simple, yet it's quite astounding. Don't let your weakest point be your downfall, whatever it may be. Work at it so, you're not, so it doesn't become an easy target. And again, I'm gonna come back to marketing, but um, for many recruiters, their weakest point is, it's marketing and that's not that's not your fault by the way if you've never been shown how to market how, how would you know for, for some consultant sorry for some owners uh, the weakest point is a couple of consultants they got working for them in some cases it's their top biller that they've got working for them that they're so frightened of losing that they kind of bend over backwards but that in fact that that's that top biller is their weakest is their weakest point because this top biller this top biller as in many cases is doing 70, 60, 70, 80 percent of your total billings, that's your weakest point. Some recruiters, they only have one or two top clients who give them most of the business. That's your weakest point. And whenever we talk to clients and they say that to us, you know, that they've um they've just lost their their, 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 their top client. I always ask this question: were you aware that this could have happened at any time? And they always go, Yeah intellectually I realized that this could happen at any time but what they're doing is they kind of just buried their head in the sand saying well we'll just make we'll just make hey while we can and they just kind of got on with it not protect themselves but that was their weakest point so even Achilles was only strong at his heel anything to add to that Drew um yeah I guess this, this relates back to what we were saying about um sort of be constantly looking to change things constantly looking to optimize and constantly looking to improve and um, there will be weak points in your business right now there'll be things that you can improve um, it's important that you're continuously working on those yeah excellent excellent so even Achilles was was only as strong as his heels is the last point from from Netflix and um, House of Cards rather as I said before if you haven't watched it you know get onto Netflix and watch it it's, it's a great political drama uh, and would really would recommend it 
Drew, thank you very much indeed. Really appreciate uh, your input today. M much appreciated as always. Remember to get additional notes. Uh, go to therenegaderecruiter.com. Uh, please, please, please leave a review. Love to hear what you've got to say. Um, if you enjoyed it, tell all your friends and listen to it again and again and again. And if you didn't enjoy it, you know what I'm going to say. Don't listen. Seriously, thank you very much indeed. In next week's show, we're going to share with you the difference between the being the expert and the hired help. Drew, thank you very much indeed. That's okay. Until next time, take care, take action, and be relentless. <laughs>